morning fellowship. It is so good to be home. Um, I just want to say a quick thank you to all of you um, for who sent emails and texts and were covering us in prayer when we were in India. I just want you to know that we felt so carried by your prayers. I personally felt so carried by your prayers. Um, thank you for so many of you who have been praying for me as I'm 14 weeks along now and you know I have a 10 month old so you know what's coming so thank you for carrying me and my family in prayer. Um, just know that those prayers cover us when my baby wakes up at 2 in the morning and is screaming. Those prayers cover us when I'm on a 14 hour flight and my ankles are super swollen. Those prayers cover us in the moments when you probably least expect it, but when God knows we most need it. So I just want to say thank you. Um, and it is so good to be home with all of you. I want to open us up uh, this morning. As I've been praying and reflecting on what the Lord wanted to say today, I wanted to just call out kind of an elephant in the room. I want to give us a moment to reflect and to pause and to ask a question, and I'm going to encourage you to be really honest with yourself. What did you bring into the room this morning? What did you come in with this morning that maybe is clouding your ability to focus and be fully present in this room? When God brings us into this space, he's not bringing us here just to check off another, oh, we went to church on a Sunday morning. The God of the universe has something here waiting for you. His hands are open and he is willing and he's, say, he's saying, my child, will you just receive it? But sometimes because of who we are and the way life happens, sometimes we come in here and we've got that argument on our mind instead. Or we've got that wayward child on our mind instead. Or we've got that bill that's looming on our mind instead. And the enemy uses those things to block and hinder what it is that the Spirit of God wants to say to all of us this morning. So I want to take a moment and I want to give you a moment to reflect. I'm going to ask you, what, what did you bring into the room this morning? And would you be brave enough to open up your hands and say, God, I, I can't carry this. And I don't want to miss a single thing that you have to say to me this morning. And as you do that and as you reflect, I'm going to read a scripture over you. And my prayer is that the Lord of the universe would come and wrap his loving arms around you. Take that thing away from you and remind you that he is near. That he's here. And he has something ready for you. No matter how long you've been following him, no matter if you're a cynic and you're not following him, God has something to say to us this morning. God, would you open our hearts? This morning's passage is from Philippians 4, 4 through 9. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice. And the God of peace will be with you. And the God of peace will be with you. God of peace, we come before you humbly as we know how. So grateful for your presence in this place. So thankful that you are a God that lacks nothing, that in you we lack nothing. Spirit of God, would you speak to us the way only you can? God, would you remove all of me? God, right now I give you all of me. Your humble servant comes before you asking that you would speak to your children, that you would transform us and renew us into a closer version of your image. God, we need you. 
We love you so much. And Jesus, it's in your mighty and matchless name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. When I was in elementary school, um, we had this uh, math formula that we had to learn that was super silly and ridiculous, but apparently it like carried me all the way through high school, so I guess it was kind of useful. And it was called the Order of Operations. And it was PEMDAS. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. Does anybody remember that? Yeah, they've been teaching that for a long time. Some of you guys who were like, no, I had to learn the new math. I don't know what you're talking about, Angela. That's fine. Um, back in the day, I'm 33. I can't really say that yet. But back when I was in elementary school, that was how we learned the order of operations. And order of operations actually served a purpose because in mixed math equations, when you would look at something and it didn't quite make sense, with no point of reference, it would seem as though the answer would depend on how somebody else would choose to solve it. But in math, you can't really leave it up to that kind of flexibility. You can't leave the answer, you can't leave the solution up to that kind of uncertainty. That's actually just not how math works. And if the exact same expression can be calculated so that you can arrive at two or more different answers, again, that's not how math works. To eliminate the confusion, they give us this order of operations. Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally. And the order of operations teaches us what should take precedence when it comes to solving and finding solutions for these problems that we're, that we're presented with. And as we enter into this time of Thanksgiving, this season of Thanksgiving, I know some of you are Christmas buffs. I'm married to a Christmas buff, but I love Thanksgiving. And as we enter into this time of Thanksgiving, today we're going to talk about thankfulness. But we're not going to talk about it from a traditional sense, because if I'm honest with you, if I'm transparent with you, as I was studying this passage, that's actually not how the Lord dealt with me in this issue of thankfulness. I believe the Lord is saying, yes, thankfulness is the life that I want you to live. It is an attitude that I want you to reflect. But there's actually some things that are missing before you get to thankfulness. The reason why, my child, it's so hard for you to live this life that reflects thankfulness all the time is because you're actually skipping a few steps. There's a few things that you're missing. Now, I want you to hear me well. I will never tell you that our relationship with the Lord can be prescriptive, right? It's not going to be an A plus B equals C kind of situation. But I do believe that the scripture here offers us a form of saying, when you do these things, the fruit of that will be thankfulness. The fruit of this, living this lifestyle will be thankfulness. So today we're going to unpack this scripture. And um, I'm just going to tell all y'all right now, the spirit of God has been dealing with me and jacking me up. And so I'm going to invite you into that space. Okay. Okay. You ready? Okay. Here we go. So uh, we see here that in a society that I think has made an art form out of complaining. And when I say made an art form out of complaining, I mean People actually gain more Instagram and YouTube followers by perfecting their art of complaining, by perfecting the way they critique, the way they, they're angry about something. We've, our society actually celebrates that. So when we live in a society that's mastered this art of convincing us that we don't have enough and that, we should, that what we do have shouldn't satisfy us, it leads us to this place of like a low burning sense of lack of satisfaction in our lives. And the problem is, it's just the water that we're swimming in. We don't even really realize it's happening. We don't even realize that it's happening. And it drives us to always achieve and want just one more. Just one more achievement, just one more raise, just one more date with that cute guy or girl. So how do we fight that? How do we combat that? As, as people who say that we're followers of Jesus, how do we fight that? Or even some of us, if you're here today and you're like, Angela, I don't follow this guy, Jesus. That's okay. I still believe that thankfulness is something that we should all be desiring to crave. And my hope today is that we, what we present as we look at this passage is that it would challenge all of us in where we stand when it comes to this heart of thankfulness. I believe the reason why we fall into the trap that, the world, has fall, that has, the world has set for us is we're just not the best at fostering thankfulness in all situations. I both really love and really struggle with going to India. Um, I love the Indian church and the way that 
the gospel is spreading like wildfire. I love the way that their fire for God is so deep and runs so strong that I'm actually confronted with the reality of all the ways that I lack gratitude in my everyday life. The way they worship, they just live and breathe and serve, and the way that they do that are just tangible expressions of the hands and feet of Jesus in a way that I've never experienced before. They worship out in fields, you know, and I get upset if the AC is broken in here. You know, they, they use drums and maracas for worship, and I have the nerve to come in and be like, they didn't sing God, I look to you, but you did today. Thank you, Larissa. <laughs> and I'm confronted with those ways that in my own heart, you know, I'd never say it out loud, but in my own heart, I lack gratitude. But here's the thing. We serve a super kind God. Because every time I'm confronted with those things, God doesn't shame me. God reminds me that he is bringing me there to shift my perspective. And today I I stand before you and I desire to share with you some deep, deep wonderings about what the Lord has led me to and what I believe that the Lord is calling us to as Fellowship Pasadena I believe that he's calling us to a perspective shift. And not just a perspective shift in one area, but I think that there's three things in particular that God is calling us to when it comes to our perspective shift. Why do we need a perspective shift? Because perspective literally is the way that we see the world. It's the way that we see things. I'll never forget when I first got my glasses. Um, I didn't even know how much of the world I was missing out on until I put on my glasses and could see clearly. I wasn't even aware of how blurry and out of focus certain aspects of my life were, mainly street signs. (laughs) I didn't even realize it until I got the right prescription to allow me to see clearly. So let's look at this passage again and see how the Lord could be inviting us into a perspective shift. A perspective shift of worship, a perspective shift of of how we think about peace, and a perspective shift on thankfulness. For those of you who are note takers, those are going to be my three points today, so heads up. We're going to talk about a perspective shift on worship, a perspective shift on peace, and a perspective shift on thankfulness. First, with this perspective shift about worship, verses four and five say, rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Now for some context here, the Apostle Paul is writing from prison to Christians who are actually suffering for their faith. He's trying to help them understand that they, at all times they need to be joyful or glad, which is what the translation of that word rejoice means. That this idea of Christian joy is not temporal or fleeting but it act, or depending on our circumstances, but it's actually predicated on the fact that at all times we are in Christ. I'm going to say that again, that it is not, Christian joy is not fleeting or temporal. It doesn't depend on our circumstances. It is simply and strictly predicated on the fact that we are in Christ. Paul's challenge to us in the church, well, to the church at Philippi, and I think to us, is that they should be a church that is marked by rejoicing. They should be a church that is known for their gladness, that is known for their ability to have joy at all times, at all times, at all times. I'm actually always struck whenever the Bible uses um, absolute language like that, all, everything, nothing, nothing. Why? Why would the breathed word of God use absolute language? I believe it's because God wants us to remember that at all times we are always in Christ. Romans 8.38 says, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Again, absolute language. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. My friends, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. This is the word of God. Do you believe it? Do we live like we believe it? I know I'm guilty of it. I don't all the time. I know y'all probably like, they let a pastor pastor who doesn't live like that? Yes, they do. Blame Michael. <laughs> At 
all times. This is absolute language. That means God did not write a condition in there. He didn't write a condition for us for when we can rejoice. He also didn't write a condition for when we are in Christ. That's good news. That's great news. And Fellowship Pasadena, I have to tell you, y'all were on my heart the entire time I was in India because I believe that God has called us to be a church in our community that is marked by rejoicing. That as people meet us, they should be able to see there is something different about that brother. There is something different about that sister. And it should be invitational. When we were in India, we had the opportunity. Oh, I'm going to be sharing a lot about India. So just be ready. Okay, here we go. When we were in India, we had the opportunity to participate in a Sunday celebration. And the Sunday celebration was a Sunday service. And it was actually all of the churches in Delhi came together for this one Sunday service. So there was like about 600 people in a room. It, there was a, probably a third of them were children. It was literally incredible. And it was powerful. It was beautiful. It lasted almost three hours. And the whole first like 45 to 50 minutes of the service was just praise and worship. It was just a time of worshiping. And all of the songs were in Hindi, so I didn't know what they were singing. But what I remember is the worship leader. What I remember about the worship leader, she had this beautiful sari on that was blue with gold sparkles. She sat on the floor with a drum in her lap, a mic in front of her face. And the entire time she sang, and she sang songs of worship, sang songs of adoration unto the Lord. And at one point, during what seemed to be a celebratory song, I looked up at her and she had tears streaming down her face. And she was smiling. Tears just streaming down her face. And in that moment, brothers and sisters, I felt invited into worship with her. I didn't know the words. I certainly didn't know the melody. But what I was invited into was a place of rejoicing. I don't know her story. I don't know what she's been through. I know some of those brothers and sisters traveled eight hours just to get to church that morning. But did that hinder her rejoicing? No. In fact, there was an overflow of rejoicing, so much so that I was moved to tears. And it made me wonder. I wonder, for those of us who know and follow Jesus, do our lives invite people into an authentic place before the Lord? Do the way we live our lives, is it invitational to come and sit at the feet of Jesus? This week I had an opportunity to go to a pastoral retreat and we were with a clinical psychologist and he said to us that one of the keys of building community, authentic community, is this idea of being invitational. What he said was, uh, one thing that stuck with me, he says, when it comes to being invitational and creating community, there is no neutral. You're either doing it or you're not. You're either doing it or you're not. And that was deeply convicting for me. Because if someone was to watch our lives, if someone, uh, would our lives extend an invitation, would it stir in them a desire to know the king of glory that moves us to tears? I wonder. It makes me wonder. And when we talk about a perspective shift of our worship, I hope that you're tracking with me. The idea here is that every aspect of our lives is an act of worship. Because worship is simply ascribing worth where it belongs. Jesus said in John 16, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. In this world you will have trouble. Jesus didn't say may or might. Again, he was using absolute language. You will have trouble. And friends, that's because we live in a fallen and, we, and a broken world. We live in a world that sadly is plagued by sin. But the good news of the gospel is that the resurrection of Jesus defeated death in the grave. And he has overcome the world. He has overcome the world. Now, I don't know about you but I could run some pregnant laps around this auditorium knowing that because of the death of Jesus Christ, he's overcome the world. And if he's overcome the entire world, then clearly he's overcome whatever circumstances I have to deal with in my life. Yeah. 
That is good news. So what does this mean for us when we talk about rejoicing at all times? It means that it's important that our perspectives stay rightly aligned. That no matter what we go through, we understand that Jesus is still on the throne. And I'm not trying to tell you to hyper-spiritualize and over-spiritualize your life and just like ignore the things that are going on. But when it comes to the things that you allow to overwhelm you, why do we feel overwhelmed? It's because our perspective is off. When it comes to worship, what are we worshiping? Who are we worshiping? Is it our jobs? Is it our kids? What are we worshiping? And in this passage, when we talk about worship, when we talk about what we're worshiping, I believe that when we have our perspectives off in that area, it affects this next point about our peace. And I believe that God is inviting us into a perspective shift about peace. And I want to share with you a part of my story that might be hard for some of you to hear. You might be able to relate, you might not. But I'm going to be super vulnerable and transparent. Because my, my experience is not meant to be prescriptive, but I do pray that the way that God has moved in my life would hopefully bring hope for how he can move in yours. Earlier this year, I was clinically diagnosed with anxiety. And when I sat in that doctor's office and I heard her explain all the implications of it, I have to be honest, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Because I was just going back to therapy to, you know, do the right thing. Everybody should be in therapy. Yeah, I'm a healthy Christian. And she, it hit me like a ton of bricks. But then as she began to unpack how anxiety manifests in our lives, she also gave language to something that's been plaguing me for the last 10 years of my life that I didn't even know was a burden, that I didn't even have language for. She was able to speak words and speak life into it. And then this is where my faith and what I worship really collided. Verse 5 starts with, the Lord is, uh, verse 5 ends with, the Lord is near. And verse 6 goes into, do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the God of peace, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I will be honest, the way I was raised in church, I was taught that if you get a diagnosis from a doctor, you simply read a scripture, you pray that, and boop, it's gone. Like a genie bottle. Gone. And so, for years, I actually thought that something was wrong with my faith. Because, God, why do I still get this tightness in my chest? God, why am I still so consumed with, this, with these thoughts? God, why I'm praying and I'm asking you and you say, don't worry about anything, and I'm not worrying, so why aren't you working? <laughs> Can I just be real before all of you? And I began to wonder, God, am I, am I doing this thing wrong? Because anxiety attacks kept happening. But here's the thing that I began to realize. It wasn't necessarily the anxiety attack that was the problem. I had been ignoring the symptoms that led up to that moment for a long time. There had been warning signs leading up to that event. The, attack was sim- the attacks were simply the culmination of me ignoring signs that my body and my environment were trying to show me. And as I read verse 6, I've read it a million times. Like I said, this was the scripture that I would hold on to in moments when I felt anxious. And I've sent it to students over the years when I was pastoring. I've sent it to adults as an encouragement. But in this circumstance, Paul says, in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And as I've navigated this issue of anxiety with the Lord and with my therapist, one of the overwhelming things, themes in my life that keeps coming up is I am obsessed with control. Am I the only one? I am obsessed with control in my life. Because at some point in my life, I learned that there are some things in my life that I just need to have a handle on. Buck up, Angela. Take care of it. Stop worrying about it. Don't wait for somebody else to do it. You have everything you need in you to do it. 
Just buck up and do it. That message I received along the way taught me that maybe God doesn't care about those smaller areas of my life. And that I just need to take care of it on my own. And I need to save my prayer life for really big things. I need to save my prayer life for if I get sick. I need to save my prayer life for if I'm in financial crisis. I need to save my prayer life for my unsaved relatives. Something monumental, something big like that. But what I didn't realize is that it wasn't the big things in my life that were driving me to points of anxiety or to places of anxiety. It was the little everyday stresses that I insisted on carrying myself that slowly built up subversively to the point that I didn't even notice the mountain that had grown in my life. My body would try to warn me with tightness in my shoulders. My friends would try to warn me by saying, Angela, you're saying yes to too much. But I could do it. I got this. I am strong and independent. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I had the nerve to invoke the name of Christ when I know I wasn't leaning on him for any of it. How many of us do that? I know I'm not the only one. And if I am, that's okay. Me and Jesus, we got this. (laughs) But that couldn't be farther from the truth. It couldn't be farther from the truth. (laughs) Every time I picked up a worry or a bother that wasn't mine to carry, I was not coming to the Lord with prayer and petition and thanksgiving. Instead, I was turning my back on him with pride, arrogance, and ungratefulness. Here's the key. Praying with thanksgiving is an explicit acknowledgement of the fact that we are created by the creator to have utter dependence on him. To have utter dependence on him. It is a recognition that everything comes as a gift, that everything he gives us is meant for stewardship and dedication to him, and that the loss, this is the key, it turned my life upside down, y'all, that the loss of this thankfulness actually leads to idolatry. It leads to idolatry of my finances. It'll lead to idolatry of my children. It'll lead to idolatry of my spouse. When I was single, it led to the idolatry of my lack of spouse. It led to the idolatry of education. And I had built up these idols that then became all-consuming because I couldn't satisfy them. I couldn't do anything to be good enough in these different areas. Jesus, I know you died on the cross for me. I don't know that you care for me, but I'm going to go ahead and take control, and I'm going to go ahead and just wait to use your genie magic for when I really need you. And friends, here's the thing. We would never say this out loud, right? Like, you would never go around and admit that. I could never, as a pastor of this church, be like, that's what I was waiting for. But it was in my actions. Because my perspective of peace was, well, once I have all of these things taken care of, then I, get to, then I get to benefit from this God of peace. But instead, God was saying, my girl, I want you to bring all of those things to me in exchange for my peace. I want to do a great exchange with you. Because while I've given you gifts and talents and abilities... I never meant for you to carry all that on your own. I actually wanted to do this with you. And I wanted to remind you that I am near. Don't leave me behind. Let's walk out this thing together all the time. I want to ask you, um, and again, I'm going to encourage you to be honest with yourself. Where are those areas of your life that you think maybe Jesus has forgotten or doesn't care about certain areas of your life? What are those spaces? And maybe just maybe the God of the universe is actually inviting you to open up your heart and your mind and your hands to give those things to him today in exchange for his peace. Because verse 6 continues and says, present all your requests to God 
and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know that peace, that word peace there in the Hebrew is the word shalom. And the word shalom means harmony, wholeness, completeness. I will confess, I cannot get back the things that anxiety has robbed from me. I can't get back those moments that I've had to say no because anxiety has frozen me still. But where I have found hope and where I have found peace has been in the places where I've said, God, there's so much lack here. And he says, it's okay. When you're in me, you lack nothing. When you abide in me and I abide in you, you lack nothing. I don't know who is here today, but friends, I, you need to hear me when I tell you. When you abide in him and he abides in you, you lack nothing. And you might be here today and say, but Angela, you just don't know the thing that I'm facing. You don't know how huge this is. But I do know a God who spoke and created the heavens and the earth. I know a God who breathed and turned dust into a man. I do know a God who splits oceans, who brings the dead back to life, and who through a death on a cross brought forgiveness and salvation to the entire world. And I promise you, no brokenness in our lives is too big because Jesus overcame the world. And in him, you lack nothing. Amen? Amen. I believe Jesus wants to, pers to shift our perspective of how we think about peace. That peace is accepting that fact that no matter what we're going through, in him we lack nothing. He is our fortress. He is our strong tower. He is our hiding place. And it doesn't mean that things won't happen. It doesn't mean that troubles won't come our way. But when we have a proper perspective on peace, we can see those things happening and we can be in alignment with the Lord where he can speak and give peace while we navigate through life. Because he knows what's coming. He knows what's coming our way. And he also has said, do not be anxious. It's a funny thing. It's a funny thing to know that God knows that in this life we will have troubles. And yet he has still given us this amazing peace. In my mind, that's a God who cares. That's a God who loves so deeply there's nothing that we can do to be separated from that love. That has been the hope that I have found on this journey as I myself have begun to shift my perspective of peace. When I began this sermon, I told you that the sermon was about thankfulness. We haven't talked about thankfulness at all. <laughs> but I also told you, excuse me, about this order of operations. That as I've been asking God, what do you what is it that you want us to know about thankfulness? Is that these two things, how we worship and our ideas about peace, we need to get those in alignment first. Because then when we have those things in alignment, the fruit of that is thankfulness. And again, this isn't prescriptive. But as we follow the passage here, we can see that Paul wrote very intentionally. He put things in order intentionally. The other night when I was driving, um, sometimes I am in denial about the fact that I'm in my 30s. I still feel like I'm 15. And then there are moments where the Lord's like, psych, girl, you're getting older. And I'm like, oh, man. That happened the other day. I was driving to dinner. The baby was in the back seat. And it was nighttime. And I'm driving, and all of a sudden, it was like somebody put bifocals in my windshield. I was like, oh, I can't see anything. Everything went blurry. 
And I knew it was because I was tired. And I was like ugh, rubbing my eyes. I was like ugh, squinting. Nothing would help. But then I remembered that my glasses were in my purse. And I was like, oh, okay, I guess I'll put them on. And I put them on. I didn't put them on because I knew it was the right thing to do. I actually put them on because in my head I was like, oh, the baby's in the back seat. I can't drive like this. Like, <laughs> in my head I was like, I don't want to put the baby in danger, so I'm going to put my glasses on. But then as I was driving, I had a reminder. I was like, wait a minute, your life is valuable too. You need to put your glasses on. And I wonder, <laughs> I wonder, do, do we do that often where we're like, oh, I'm going to do the right thing for this person because it's good. But then when it comes to us and taking care of ourselves, we forget that we're just as valuable. Yeah. Because here's the thing. In verse 8, Paul says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul is literally telling us what to focus our minds on here. He is giving us the lens prescriptive for our perspective of thankfulness. I want to ask you, uh, if I ask you right now to think about something that's lovely, what do you think about? I want to hear from you. If I ask you to think about something that's lovely, something that's lovely, it can be simple. The mountains. What else? Say it again. The rivers. What else? Babies. What else? Breathing. Amen. I have a hard time with that nowadays too, okay? There's a little person in there. They don't care about my, my lungs. <laughs> Anybody else? Something that's lovely. Yes. Your mom. Now, when we think about things that were, are lovely, I wish you had my vantage point because something happened when we talked about that. Everybody's faces kind of went from like, which I don't know if that's an indicator of the sermon, but <laughs> it's fine. Everybody's faces went from like, to like, <laughs> it's amazing. Everybody's face changed. That was simply one lens. That was simply one thing that we thought about that's lovely. And you know what that did for me? Everything that y'all said in my heart, I was like, oh, yeah, thank you, God. Thanks, God, for the mountains. They're beautiful. Thanks, God, for my babies. I'm so thankful. Thanks, God, for my mom, because she's amazing. I wonder, when we talk about that perspective shift of thankfulness, here is what Paul is giving us a space that literally is saying, think on these things. Again, don't ignore what's happening in your life. But when it comes to living a life of thankfulness, remember those things. And thankfulness actually has nothing to do with your circumstances. So whether you have a lot or a little or you're struggling or you're in a great place or you're in a mountain high with the Lord or maybe you're a cynic and you're like not trying to follow Jesus at all, regardless of where you are, I want you to understand that this scripture is saying whatever is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. When we live a life of thankfulness, he says, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. There are certainly a lot of things that could trigger my anxiety. Um, just from everyday stress, life, all that kind of stuff. But nothing more potentially triggering this year than becoming a mother. All of a sudden I went from just worrying about myself to now there's this human who is literally can't do anything and I have to keep them alive. Going 10 months strong, oh yeah. <laughs> doing great. And early on, people would ask me, how are you doing? Which I just want to say for the moms in the place, that's a really hard question for us to answer, OK? There's hormones raging. Life is happening. I couldn't take walks because it was raining every day, so I got no fresh air. It was hard, OK? But the hardest part was I couldn't get my, my spiritual habits back in the rhythm. I couldn't get up early and spend time with the Lord. I wasn't able to spend time in prayer reading my Bible. And I was like, 
oh, how am I going to stay close to the Lord? Now this baby's in the way of everything. <laughs> and I had this moment one day where I just felt the Lord say, like, I'm your daily bread. I'm your daily bread. Let me give you my daily bread. When you're changing that diaper, that's an act of worship. When you're feeding this baby, you're honoring me by being a good steward of this blessing. I'm your daily bread. Will you seek me in those daily spaces? And slowly, my spiritual life began to change. It had to change. Now, I don't know what life-altering circumstances come your way, whether it's a death in your family, whether it's an addition of a new person in your family, whether it's a surgery, whether it's a sickness, whether it's a financial crisis, I don't know where you are this morning. I would love to hear all of your stories, but admittedly, I don't know. But one thing that I do know is that if you've heard nothing else about today, a perspective shift means understanding this. He is our daily bread. There is a daily grace and mercy that is available to us every morning when we wake up. The Lord is anxiously, excitedly ready to give us this daily bread. And I believe that as we enter into this Thanksgiving season, as we enter into this holiday season, a time that can be hard, a time where we might have to deal with family that's really tough to deal with, a time where we might be faced with loneliness, a time where we might be faced with fill in the blank. I believe that the Lord has something to say to each of us. My child, my daughter, my son, I am your daily bread. Will you abide in me as I abide in you? So that at all times, your life can be marked by rejoicing. And Paul says, and the God of peace will be with you. Today, maybe the Lord is inviting you to sing a new song, to rejoice and to worship in freedom. Maybe he's trying to remind you that an intellectual knowledge of who he is can also help then inform a deep faith in believing that he will do what he said he's going to do, and that will bathe us in peace. And that a new lens, a new perspective, an ability to build upon those things, our worship, our peace, will then result in living a life of gratitude and thanks, thankfulness that can then be invitational to those around us. In a world saturated with complaint, may we be marked by thankfulness. May we be marked with rejoicing. Right now, I'm going to invite the worship team up. And we're going to sing a song called Build My Life. We're going to sing a bit of the song. And as we worship, I want us to practice this idea of just laying down those things that might hinder our peace. Maybe today you're in a place where you haven't received that daily bread from the Lord. You haven't received that daily sustenance that he wants to give you, that strength that he wants to give you for today. As you sing, as you worship, I pray that the Spirit of God would speak in a way like only he can and meet you right where you are for a satisfaction that is deeper, wider, and longer than anything we could ever imagine. To remind, remind us that in him we lack nothing. Amen? Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you so much for your presence in this place. We thank you so much for the gift and the opportunity, God, to try again, to try again to realize that you are our daily bread, to try again to live a life of thankfulness, to try again to live a life with proper perspective. Would you speak and move now in this place? Not just for this moment, not just for the service, God, but each and every day of this week, God, would you remind us that you are our daily bread and that we can build our lives upon you and your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.